and when you can use quantitative research. So unlike in qualitative research, in quantitative research, you seek to find a single meaning um, or phenomenon of interest. Um, so quantitative research appeals to a different ontological uh, perspective or ontological stance and a different epistemological stance to that of qualitative research. So quantitative research is um, likely to be objectivist ontology and the um, positivist epistemology. That is important to remember because as we've um, uh, realized over this time is that the research begins with an idea and the research idea is just a concept. And at that point, you have not yet formulated your research question. So once you have uh, formulated your research question, uh, that's when you, you choose which methodology you're going to use. But before that, you have chosen whether you are leaning towards quantitative or qualitative because you've got a research concept, you've got an idea which is a research concept, and the research concept is before your research question. So at that point, you know whether you are going to do a, a, um, a quantitative or qualitative research. And because we normally say in research that the research methodology is the dictated by the research question, but the research question itself is influenced by the research philosophy um, which is those epistemological and ontological things we talked about. Um, so I'll skip that one because that's what I've just talked about, um, where quantitative research leans. And what, one significant difference between quantitative research and qualitative research is that, whereas in quantitative, qualitative research, we construct meaning from existing phenomena, from in quantitative research, we seek to find the meaning from what is already existing. So we, we look for a unitary agreement. So we, for that reason, in quantitative research, it's common to formulate hypotheses. And there are two types of hypotheses. There is a um, exploratory and confirmatory. Exploratory is when you don't know what is written on the topic and you are exploring the area. So you formulate the hypothesis, you say, I think A and B could be there. Whereas if you are, uh, if, if you, if you are um, formulating a confirmatory hypothesis, in that case, you are looking at what already exists. So you look at the literature, you check the, the gaps in the literature, you look at the theory and you say, theory tells us this, but is this correct? So that is confirmatory hypothesis. And it's mostly deductive, um, can be inductive sometimes. Uh, deductive is just what I talked about. You are confirming something, so that is deductive. Uh, whereas if you are exploring, during your exploration, you might come up with other theories so that from that perspective, it becomes inductive, um, which is the predominant aspect of qualitative research. It's usually inductive because you're, you're, you're looking at evidence from inside up. They, there are too many types of quantitative uh, approaches. There is experimental and non-experimental. Uh, non-experimental usually is also called observational quasi-experiments, um, or even in natural experiments, you find such terminologies used um, interchangeably. I hope to come back to that later. Um, the designs are there. There's an avalanche of designs. There is a case study where you just um, follow a case, maybe, but maybe somebody had COVID and they had particular symptoms, and, and, and you follow that case, and that's a case study. So that's the, the least um, in terms of evidence um, uh, informing uh, the, the case study. Then there are retrospective studies. Retrospective, as the name suggests, you are looking backwards. And the, there is also prospective, which is you're looking forwards. So these uh, types of studies are normally I, I, are useful in social sciences and in epidemiological studies. For instance, um, if you want to look at the, does uh, smoking cause cancer, for instance, so you can look at the find people who smoked between period maybe maybe from maybe 1990 to 2000. 
uh, you find people who smoked. So that is retrospective because you are looking backwards. You find people who smoked and then you also find another group of people who did not smoke in the same period. Um, that's a control group. And then you look at the outcome of interest. Did they develop cancer? Did those who smoked develop cancer? Was there more cancer in those who smoked than compared to those who did not smoke? Whereas perspective, you start now and you are looking forward, you follow them forwards. So you say, okay, from today, um, this is 2022. Uh, we want to see if people who start smoking now, who are smoking now, if they'll develop cancer in 10 years. So you start following them. And at the end of 10 years, you look at the evidence and see, did you have more cancer patients from the group that was smoking compared to the group that was not smoking? So that is a perspective. Um, type of design as, as contrasted from the retrospective type of design. So these types of designs are usually common in epidemiological studies and they're quite useful where you want large samples. Um, and, and, and it's usually something you wouldn't, uh, especially like prospective, um, they're quite expensive, that's the disadvantage. Um, and and the, also ethical issues come in. For instance, you cannot randomize people to smoking and not smoking, drinking, not drinking. You say, okay, let's see what happens if you, or speeding or not and, and, and out of speeding. So because of that, there are ethical implications. And for that reason, you use observational, the four under observational studies where you've already the evidence based on people's lifestyles or, or another uh, type of evidence. It, it, it has already happened. You are not creating it. You are not uh, asking people to start smoking. You're not asking people to start drinking. It has already happened. Or people live that type of lifestyle. So you take advantage of that. So that's, um, those are, those are um, usually like cohort studies. Randomized controlled trials, they actually sit at the helm of uh, quantitative research where you've got, you randomize people to, to, to the control group and the treatment group. The treatment group, is the group that uh, has got the uh, outcome of interest. Um, case controlled studies, again, similar to randomized trials, but they are not randomized. The difference is that you pick two groups. One group has got the area of interest or is, uh, uh, outcome of interest. The other group does not have an outcome of interest. But because you are looking only at the single case, it's a case controlled study. So you can have, it's, it's more like an, an, an uh, improvement on the case study. So you're looking at an outcome of interest, but you, you, you create two groups so that you've got a control group. Um, this is just a continuation a list of all types of um, analytical research, um, um, of quantitative research. And I've put an, ast an asterisk on epidemiological studies because epidemiology, it uses slightly different language uh, to normal uh, or, or common day statistics language, um, which we'll look at later on. And it, it is reported if, it, if, if for instance, we are, you are looking at people who smoke and people who did not smoke. So you're looking at the risk ratios of developing cancer or developing an outcome of interest to those people who did not. So you talk about odds ratio and relative ratio, for instance. And, and those are quite important because you are looking at the risk of developing a particular condition. So that's why I put an asterisk there just to emphasize that there is a slight different language and the, and the type of statistics um, that, 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 you have, that you look at when you're looking at epidemiological studies. Whereas all these others from H to A, they would probably um, look at something different. Um, The other important thing that we need to do is obviously you've got the research idea, you identified your research philosophy, which is objectivist, hopefully, and the um, objectivist ontology and the and the, uh, um, the your epistemology is the positivist. So there are too many types of data then. So how are you going to collect the data? So that becomes a cardinal. And there are two types of data. Overall, there is what we, we call categorical or qualitative data, which is nominal or ordinal. I'll explain that in a minute. So there are two types, there is quantitative and qualitative data. I'll start from the bottom because it's easier, then I'll come to the top. Um, quantitative data is of two types. Uh, there is continuous data and discrete data. Discrete simply means the, um, 
Skynet that, that which is a singular or, or something you, you can count. For instance, you, a family can be mother, father, children. So you, you count one, two, three people. You cannot say three and a half people in the house. Um, you, you, you say, oh, in our family, we were born 10, we were born five. We were not, you wouldn't say we were born six, six, six and a half, seven and a half. So that's discrete. So it's, it's, it's a definite number. Uh, whereas continuous is a, um, like weight, for instance, time. Um, those are continuous types of measurements, temperatures, because you can measure it to the billionth um, decimal place. Uh, your weight, you could say I'm 67 or 90 or whatever kilograms, but actually you're, 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 there are lots of decimals after the, the actual figure there. So that's continuous and discrete. So continuous because it has got decimals, discrete because it doesn't have decimals, it doesn't allow you to have decimals. Um, if you forget, think about the number of people in the household, that's discrete. And you can't have six and a half people in the, in the household. And now I go back to categorical data, which is nominal ordinal. Nominal data is the um, data that you collect. For instance, you say, if, if, if I put, put a questionnaire around and I say, um, how do you think my presentation was uh, on the scale of one to two? Um, if, if participant one says, uh, um, one, let's say one means good and five means bad, um, the difference between one and two is not mathematical because if you, you, you cannot subtract the nominal data, if you've got the scale of one, two, three, four, five, which is subjective data, because what my one is will not be your one. And what your two is will not be my two. So because that is subjective data, you cannot subject it to the same statistical tests as, as quantitative data. Because it's nominal data, you cannot subtract, you cannot find the average, for instance, because those, that, that will have no meaning. Whereas ordinal data is data that is, is still categorical, still qualitative data, but you can sort of order it to make a meaningful sort of um, understanding. Uh, for instance, if you say, um, if, if you say, oh, from the foot to the knee to the hip, so th that's some sort of order. So you can say, okay, Let's say knee, um, ankle is one, knee is two, hip is three. So th th there is some element of order because you are moving from the bottom going to the top. But it is still data that you cannot divide. It's still data that you cannot add. It's still data that you cannot um, find the average for because it's nominal data. Um, so so that, 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 that's very important because the type of data that you have somehow dictates the type of statistic that you are going to employ and the, the type of measures and how, and how you're going to interpret your statistics. So that's extremely important to understand. Um, so two types of data, qualitative and quantitative, and the, both of them have got two uh, uh, subdivisions under them. Um, I think this is what I just explained in, in great detail. Tell me, tell me. So the other thing we need to, to so, so now we've got the data, we need to collect the, the, the sample size. So first you have to identify your population of interest and from, from your population of interest, you pick your sample size. Uh, so the sample size is simply a proportion, a small percentage of what your population of interest is. The reason why we cannot test the entire population is one, it would be more expensive and time consuming. And you, you don't have the whole time in the world, and especially if you, your research is academic, um, maybe for your qualification, it, it may not be um, um, very sensible or maybe um, um, economical for you to do that unless you're an institution. But even then, you, you, that's where you go back to what we talked about earlier. You could use observational uh, data, data which has already been collected, which is secondary data. Um, there, there, there are two types of data, again, from that perspective, which are omitted. There is primary data, which is data that you collect afresh as you are doing the research. You design the questionnaire, you send it to the people, the participants return the questionnaire to you, you extract the information. That's primary data. 
secondary data, some, don't know, some people call it desk data. You see, the data that is already there, you go to maybe publicly available uh, websites or data sets or and so on and so forth and extract that data from there. So that's secondary data. But it's very common in the, um, in social sciences like economics, for instance, finance and so on and so forth. They use a lot of secondary data because the collecting primary data would be very expensive. Uh, and, and also there are ethical issues involved uh, in collecting primary data. So it's easier to use secondary data. So it has got its own advantages. However, you have to um, take certain measures in place to ensure that your, um, your, 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 your design, your researcher's design is robust um, so that you can have um, results that you can rely on. So if, if, if you collect a sample, this sample has to be representative of the population of interest. If the results have to be reliable and generalizable. For that reason, we use uh, probabilistic sampling techniques and different methods exist um, of sampling. Um, so the most common um, probabilistic method of sampling uh, is randomization. And this normally is used in the, um, in, in, when you're doing primary studies and um, where you, you, you start the study now and you, you gather the participants, so you've got a control group and you've got the, 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 the group that is the area of interest, the, the group that has got the outcome of interest. Um, so you, 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 you sample the participants based on the outcome of interest or the absence of the outcome of interest. So um, once you've randomized your, uh, your participants, um, obviously you'll have chosen your research design at that point. Um, to, to, to start with, when you are collecting your sample size, you have to factor in your, uh, your control group. How many participants do you want from the control group? How many participants do you want from the, 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 the outcome of interest group? they don't have to be on a one-to-one. -one. You don't have to have 10,000 in the control group and 10,000 in, um, in the group that has got in the research group or the treatment group, no. All that you need to, to make sure is that the characteristics of the participants are uniformly distributed in both groups. So for instance, there should be, if, 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 if you are, there should be, if, if the, for instance, there should be females in both groups and the, of equal proportion. There should be males in both groups of equal proportion. There should be children, if, if children are involved of equal proportion and so on and so forth. And by equal proportion, what I mean is, for instance, if, if, if in the control group have got um, 100 people and the, um, the, 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 the treatment group has 200 people, so you need maybe to have 10 women in the control group and 20 women in the treatment group. So that is proportional or they about give, it, give, it, give or take. Um, it is also important to understand uh, the basic statistics, um, the, the same one which talks about the measures of central tendency, which is the mean, which is the average, observation, the mode, which is most frequent observation, the median, mid observation. Um, the, 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 the top and the bottom, A and B are the mostly used in statistics and, and, in, and, and in research. It's quite rare to find the mode reported. The mean is useful uh, for all quantitative data, whereas the median is, is the best suited if you are looking at qualitative data. Like we talked about earlier on there, when you've got qualitative data, where you have ordered data, you've got ordinal, or ordinal or nominal data, you cannot use averages for that. So the best is the, 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 the median. And there are also sometimes when the median is good even for quantitative data. For instance, if you are collecting, um, you, 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 are, you want to find the average age of a grade 12 student in Zambia or in another country. Um, so you, you, you've you got maybe one child who is maybe most grade 12 students are around 16, but maybe there is one who is a nine and there is another one who is 23. 
So those two in statistics, we call them outliers. And because they are outliers, you would need to eliminate them from your study sample. Because if you include them, they will pull your mean towards one side or the other. For instance, if, the mean, if most of the children are between 16 and 17, the mean age for, for, for a grade 12 will probably be 16 and a half. But if you include somebody who is 30 years in that, in, in that age group, in, in that sample size, they will pull the statistics so that maybe the mean age of, of, of the students becomes 18, when actually in the class, there is only one person who is above 18. So you, th there is a good reason why you can use the median instead of the mean. So you look at your sample. Set. So if you've got um, very stretched uh, sample where you've got significant outliers, the median would be the best major central tendency um in, in that respect or you you you, you can use the intercontinental range as well where you get the the difference between the upper quarter and the medium quarter and then the lower quarter to get the the, the major the central tendency which is the, the intercontinental range now they they they, they, they are also they, these these measures of central tendency we, we, we we've talked about um also have got, um, I think I've, I've, I've gone too far somewhere. Okay. I don't know how I've reached there. I need to come back, sorry. Okay, there we go. So the, the, these measures of central tendency, um, they are what we call the point statistics. So if the mean is 16.5, for instance, but the actual range of the children in the class, the actual ages might be 14 to 18. So that is called the dispersion or the variability or the, the, the it is the dispersion or the variability in the sample. How variable are they? If you are measuring height, maybe somebody is six foot, maybe somebody is, maybe the tallest person in the group is the um, two meters tall. Whereas all the other average people, they, or every other person, they range between 165 and 180. So, and, and the, maybe the shortest is uh, maybe 145. So the, the difference between the shortest and the tallest, that's the variability. Um, which in the, and there are different types of how you can measure variability. You can measure it using the range, which is the highest score minus the lowest score or the tallest minus the shortest. Um, or you can use the variance, which is the squared deviation. Uh, the deviation, by the way, is just the, the score, the measure that you collected minus the mean. And that, that gives you the deviation. That's the, how far from the mean is your score. So that is the, 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 the deviation. Um, which when you, you, you compute it, it becomes the standard deviation. Um, and there is a relationship between standard deviation and variance um, because one is the square root of the other and the other way around. Uh, then there is the intercortal range, uh, which you use for, um, you use the intercortal range and, and, and it's quite good for median. Uh, if, you are, if you are using the median as your, 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 your measure of central tendency. And, and there's also the mean deviation. So the, these are some of the, the, the common ones. Um, the mostly used ones that you're going to find in most uh, research papers are these three, the top three. The range, the variance, and the, um, so sorry, the top four. The range, the variance, the standard deviation, and the intercortal range. So how do you collect the, the data, so there are different ways you can use interviews, but in this case, interviews have to be structured as opposed to unstructured or semi-structured interviews in the qualitative research. Um, you can use um, um, observational data, as we talked about, which we call naturally occurring experiments, uh, each in code studies. Um, I've given examples of like people who smoke and people who do not smoke. And, and then you want to see if those who smoked um, 
we are more prone or we are at higher risk of, uh, of getting breast cancer, for instance. Um, so you, you, you take advantage of the existing lifestyles of the people in the population. And in most cases, this, is, this, this data is readily available from, the, uh, from different government agencies, uh, depending on where you are, and, 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 and you can easily access it. RCT um, has got huge ethical implications because, for instance, if, if there is a new drug and you want to see if the new drug works, maybe, maybe drug A, um, there is treatment for malaria and there is a new drug that has come on the market. Um, should you give people this, should you alter the doctor's treatment to give uh, people drug A to see if it works? And what do you do to those other uh, participants who are not given drug A? So the, the two ethical dilemmas are, if drug A works better than drug B, you are depriving those in the control group of access to a better drug. If drug A has got more side effects and does not work better than the existing drug, you are exposing those in the, in the uh, exposure group to the uh, drug that potentially has got uh, bad um, outcomes and that kind of a thing. So it, it, it has got uh, those, um, it, it has got those ethical dilemmas. And, and for that reason, RCTs, um, the, 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 the ethical um, applications are quite stringent if you are applying for, uh, if, if your design is RCT, which, which stands for randomized controlled trials. And it's not randomized clinical trials, it's randomized controlled trials. Controlled because you've got a control group. So we've talked about statistics. There are so many different types of statistics, but three different many branches exist. And from there, there are other uh, peripheral branches. Um, so there is descriptive statistics, inferential statistics. I'll come back to those two because they are the ones we are going to talk about mostly. Um, then there is also mathematical statistics, which is proof-based. Um, the, the economists like this one um, because they, they, they like proving using mathematical proofs and so on and so forth. Um, there are other forms of statistics, Bayesian statistics, and, and so on and so uh, forth. Um, so descriptive statistics. So in, in, in most research uh, papers, what you're going to encounter, especially in healthcare, is the top two, uh, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Uh, very rarely, we said out that you, you, you encounter other forms of statistics. That's why I didn't include them. I just included the, the bottom one for completion sake. So descriptive statistics, as the name uh, suggests, it describes your data. So it's always the best one to start with. Once you've collected your data, you, call, you, you, you do this descriptive statistics to show you, for instance, how many women are in the sample that you've collected, uh, how many men are there, how many children, and so on and so forth. So that's descriptive statistics. That's what it tells you. And of those who are there, um, how many are between 10 and 16, how many are between 16 and 20, and so on and so forth. That's descriptive statistics. Excuse me. On the other hand, inferential statistics, it comes from the word inference. So it's the statistics where you actually now make inferences. You make conclusions, deductions from the data. You say, I think A causes B, that's inferential. And, and some, sometimes in the, what you encounter in healthcare um, research papers, and not only in healthcare research papers, in most research papers, it's not even inferential, but, but you find the results are interpreted as inferential. Uh, there are quite some stringent rules around um, interpreting that as inferential. So you, um, if you are testing a theory or you're exploring a theory, then you need to state your hypothesis. This is where, again, qualitative research differs from quantitative research because in qualitative research, there is no stating of hypothesis. And the, the, the hypothesis is always, the new hypothesis is always stated in the negative. So you always state it in the negative. So you say, for instance, you say there is no relationship between, or you say, there, Cancer does, um, smoking does not cause cancer, for instance. Um, 
the alternative hypothesis is always stated in the positive. So you say smoking causes cancer. But when we test the hypothesis, we, we never test A, we always test the null hypothesis, which is H0. And that's why when we reject, we reject the not H0 because that's what we tested. We do not um, test the alternative hypothesis. So you should never ever reject the alternative hypothesis because you never tested it. So the, the, the decision rule is the, so you reject H naught if you force. So if your results prove that um, actually cancer cause, uh, smoking causes cancer, then it, it means your new hypothesis which say the, uh, smoking does not can, cause cancer is false. So therefore you reject it and accept the alternative hypothesis. Some authors prefer to say fail to accept. So you find such a language, but we never reject the alternative hypothesis because we never tested it. So there are some errors that may come up because of that. If we fail to reject, um, for instance, type one uh, comes in when we reject the new hypothesis, um, when we should have actually have, uh, um, sorry, I think I was trying to minimize something, sorry, there we go, yeah. Type one comes in when we reject the new hypothesis, when the statement is actually true, which is a false positive. If you smoking causes cancer, but we've rejected the no hypothesis, then we've caused the type one error. And type two error uh, comes in when we accept the no hypothesis, when the statement is indeed false, failing to reject the no hypothesis when the statement is actually false. So that's a false negative. We can minimize those errors. Uh, type one error can be minimized by lowering the level at which we are testing the hypothesis. So we'll come to that one. Um, traditionally, these are tested at 1%, 5%, and 10%. Those are the common um, um, levels at which you test the, the, the hypothesis. The testing levels are called the significance levels or SI. Type two errors can be reduced by increasing sample size. So type one, you, um, you lower your level of significance. So if you, if you were testing your sample, your evidence at 10%, you go down to 5% or 1%. Type two, you increase your sample size. So significance level is a measure of evidence in the data. And, and conventionally, as I said, it's 1%, 5%, and 10%. It is the probability of the size of an error in, in, or, or the risk of us making an error. So that's the problem. So what you are saying is I'm willing to accept, I'm willing to be wrong 5% of the times. In other words, you're saying you are 95% confident that you are correct. I'm willing to be wrong 10% of the times. In other words, you're saying you are 90% confident that um, you are correct. So that's the relationship. That's how confidence intervals come in. So if the significance level is 1%, the confidence interval is 99%. If the significance level is 5%, the confidence level is the uh, interval is the 95% and so on and so forth. So how do we interpret the significance level? Those are interpreted in relationship to the p-values. P, p stands for probability, um, which is the chance of being wrong of making an error. A p-value below the significance level means that the results are statistically significant and therefore we reject H0. So if your significance level is 5% and you get results that are below 5%, it means your results are statistically significant. If your, 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 signif your results are above 5%, then your results are not statistically significant. At that level, of significance that you have chosen. And um, some researchers argue, for instance, if it is very close, maybe 5%, but you get 4.9. Some researchers argue 4.5 and 4 to 4.9. Some researchers argue that you should say it's marginally significant instead of rejecting it, instead of saying it's, it's, a, it's, it's not significant or that kind of a thing. I think I just talked about the confidence intervals. 
um, the, the, the importance, the other importance about confidence intervals is that it tells you how fast stretched the, 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 your estimates are. The closer the confidence intervals are, the, the, meaning the, the, the range is smaller of the values, the, the more um, precise your estimates are likely to be. For instance, as I gave an example about the age, ages of children um, in grade 12 class, if the ages range, if, if your the, the, the confidence intervals are maybe 14 to 7, 14 to 18, and your, your mean is 16, that's quite close. Compared to if you've got the, your, your, your confidence interval that is um, 9 to 34, and your mean is 16, those are very stretched, so you should be worried. You should be looking back into your sample. So how do we choose the statistical tests? Again, there are two types of di uh, two different types of statistical tests. There is parametric tests, which assume normal distribution assumption, and the non-parametric tests they do not assume uh, normal distribution. By the way, there are many types of distribution. There is the gamma distribution, the beta distribution, the Poisson distribution, the binomial distribution, and, and a logistic distribution, and so on and so forth. Um, but, but in this case. Um, to test for um, to, to, to use parametric tests, you have to uh, to satisfy yourself that your results um, are consistent with normal distribution, or they have passed the normal distribution test. Uh, so you always have to perform the normal distribution, uh, the the normality tests, and most of the statistical packages have got uh, these types of um, tests built in. So um, one of them is the Common Grove Simonov's test or the Shapiro-Wilk test, or you, you can do both of them. They are both uh, normality tests. So when you go to the statistical package and you choose normality, they'll ask you whether you want to, to, to conduct the, the KS test or you want to conduct the SW test. Uh, you can also graph it where you can use either the QQ plots, the PP plots or the box plots. Uh, so, so, so sometimes you use um, one more than one um, normality test just to, um, to, 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 to give more credency to your to, to your assumption. So if data are not normally distributed, then you use non-parametric tests. If data are normally distributed, use parametric tests. Uh, choosing the wrong test can lead to false conclusions. And the um, common parametric tests include um, uh, two sample T tests, or even just the, the, the T tests, uh, paired T tests. Um, ANOVA, which is analysis of variance, that's what it stands for. Um, Pearson coefficient of correlation. Um, regression analysis, that, that one has got, there, there are so many types of uh, regression analysis. Um, the generalized linear models, and the, uh, the, 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 the probit models, logistic models, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, Tobit regressions, bivariate regressions. So, so there, there are so many types of regression um, analysis. And the people have written very thick books about different types of regression. So we are not that, and this is a complete different topic on its own. Um, so those are the common parametric tests. I'm not going to run through them, um, but it's important to know that they exist and they've got their equivalences to the uh, parametric tests. Um, so, um, so for instance, the Spearman's correlation, um, it's, its equivalent is the, the, the Pearson correlation. That's the parametric test um, which you can run. So like the, 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 this is a nice little summary of how the the, the parametric and non-parametric tests compare to each other. So instead of using the PRDT test, you could use the Wickson rank sum test. Instead of using the NPRDT test, you, can, you could use the man whitney u test and so on and so forth. So all these, you would find them in the statistical package um, if you are using the proper one, which, which are normally used for, but the, the, the common statistical packages include the starter, for instance, um, R, A views, um, there, there is also great, great tail. Uh, there is the Python. Um, 
though those are like the the, the, the most common um, statistical packages. Uh, usually, you do not use Excel for statistics um, because it, it lacks the capability to, to 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 sort of give you some of these um, much more suitable statistical tests. So when you, you've done your results now, you've got your results now, you want to analyze them. So analysis involves interpreting the data. Um, once you interpret your data, you have to know that if you, if you find some association, that does not mean causation. If you find it, if your correlation values are higher, it does not necessarily mean that A caused B. It simply means there is an association. Uh, for instance, um, if, if maybe you, you, your, your results show that a class that had the uh, teachers with the very high qualifications also had the very good results. So is it because, so, so, so do you say um, the teachers, the good teachers um, were responsible for good results or could it also be that the students themselves were selectively uh, put in that class. Um, for instance, like the, the case was in the in the old days when I went to school, um, we used to have technical schools, so they would selectively select some students. They take them to Deacon, Palembe, UPS, and so on and so forth. And the, the results would be generally much better than an average school elsewhere. So, you you there may be an association, but you have to look for a causative factor. So causal inferences can only be deduced from studies with control groups and where you have actually accounted for, um, for confounding factors. For instance, in the example that I was uh, that I gave about uh, maybe a class with good students and um, produces good results, is it because they've got better teachers than the other students? Are they given more lessons than the other students? Do they have more access to resources compared to the other students? So once you've re eliminated all the confounding factors, that's when you can um, you, you eliminate every other possibility such that the only possibility remaining is that they have good teachers. That's the only reason that they produce better. So meaning you have to have a control group and expose them to exactly the same conditions, same number of classes, the same number of hours, same number of resources, um, and, and so on and so forth. You may even have to go further detail like social degradation, so social economic status, what type of homes are the children coming from, those who are in class A and those who are in class B. Because it, it could be that maybe those are happier students because they are coming from happier homes and so on and so forth. So co co causal, causal designs are actually very complicated and, and you have to be very careful when you make causal inferences. So it's always safe if you haven't accounted for a lot of things not to go causal, but you 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 go um you 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 you, you talk about correlation and um, you say yes, I found an association between A and B. And, and then you say maybe another person could find it A actually caused B. Now that's in your recommendation. So the typical designs are, there are two typical designs, the one with a control group, one without the control group. If you want to go causal, you have to have a control group and you have to account for other aspects that may have caused um, other aspects that, that may uh, confound your, your, your findings. So I've talked about this, um, you have to have, um, group A and group B, um, one is a, whatever groups you call them, one is a treatment group, the other one is a control group. Control group can be given placebo existing treatment. Um, I talked about confounding factors. So what are confounding factors? Those are the factors that could influence or bias your results and the, they, they can be anything. Um, for, for, for instance, um, maybe children are not performing well because they, one comes from a home where they don't have breakfast, another one comes from a home where they've got breakfast, but when they reach at school, they are exposed exactly to the same conditions, same class and so on and so forth. So because of that, if you are doing research, you may have to account for that social background of the children. So that's a confounding factor. Um, other confounding factors are, are inbuilt from the researcher's perspective, um, maybe, um, the response rate, uh, the selection bias, how have you selected your sample? Uh, RICO bias, um, where people 
um, memory sometimes if you're interviewing people, people don't remember things the same all the time. So you interview them today, they tell you one thing, you interview them tomorrow, they tell you the other thing. Um, so that's called recall bias. And sometimes people recall things that make an impression on their minds, not things that do not make an impression on their minds. Um, and, and, and they can fill in gaps on, on other things, but that could confound the, the, the results. So when you're analyzing the results, you, you know that association does not equal causality and the causal inferences can only be deduced from studies with control groups and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the other aspect which I thought we should just be vaguely aware of is the common terminology in the uh, epidemiological uh, studies. Uh, so they use, normally you talk about odds ratio, which is the, the association between an exposure and an outcome. It's the ratio of association between an exposure and an outcome. So what is the odds? What are the odds of developing cancer if you're exposed to A? What are the odds of not developing cancer? So this is an association. Um, relative risk is the risk ratio of, exp of, of, of an exposure uh, relative to no exposure. And again, um, and that is the, um, the PP value, which is the positive predictive value, which is the probability of obtaining a positive test for patients with a condition. And there is its, 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 its opposite counterpart, which is the negative predictive value, which is the NPV, which is the probability of obtaining a negative test for truly negative uh, patients or, or people with a negative condition. And um, both of these are interpreted as percentages, whereas the odds and the relative ratios are not interpreted as percentages. And I believe we've come to the end of the talk. Um, as I said, um, the, these are some of the, um, the, the statistical packages that you can use. Um, actually, I should mention quickly here that R is free um, and Python, uh, even in great tail, uh, EVUs and Starter, they are usually commercial, but R and Python are, are quite good because they are user developed, they are um, people who just contribute the, 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 the codes and the like. Um, and and the, um, both R, R and Python are quite easy to learn as well, um, compared to EVUs, Greater and the Starter, and despite the fact that Starter and EVUs are they, they are uh, commercial as well. So I would invite um, questions at this point. Um, and thank you so much for listening. I guess I can stop sharing now. Sure. Thank you very much sir, for the wonderful presentation. Allow me to call for questions and contributions on the presentation. It has been uh, a very educative presentation. Let's uh, share our views and our questions on the presentation, please. I don't seem to see any hand raised. Uh, can you unmute yourself if you'd want to share your thoughts? Okay, uh, Mr. Wembia, it seems you have done uh, justice to the presentation and um, silence means people have actually understood to what you, you were presenting. Uh, we'll just wait to to hear yeah. yeah, sure. We we'll just uh, wait for you to share the presentation so that we can actually run through on our own as well. Okay, uh, no, that's absolutely fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll share the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, my president, is there anything before we end the meeting? Mr. Mansa? Uh, 
Yeah, your net uh, could be very bad. Uh, I will uh, hear you. Um, there is nothing much to part from legend and appreciating the presenter. What we need is no questions. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, 